on Ollie here and this is my review of The Stones of Blood. The third story of the 16th season of Classic Doctor Who starring Tom Baker as the fourth Doctor. The Stones of Blood is the 100th story overall, it's four parts long and it's written by David Fisher. The Stones of Blood is also the third of six storylines of the Key to Time storyline and it does have a special place in my heart as The Stones of Blood was actually the first ever Classic Who story I watched in full back in 2008 during when the UK TV channels were still around, like UK TV Gold, Drama and all that, and I think I saw Stones of Blood on UK TV Drama, so yeah, this is why I think it does, it does pretty much, if it wasn't for this story, I would probably be doing these reviews. So the plot of the Stones of Blood is as follows. In search of the third segment of the key to time leads the Doctor, Romana and K-9 to Bosco Moore on Earth in the late 20th century. Here they encounter Professor Amelia Romford and Vivian Fay, who are surveying an ancient stone circle called the Nine Travellers. What is the link between you know, an ancient Celtic goddess, an alien criminal, and a transporter ship concealed in hyperspace? And can the Doctor escape the dru- druidic sacrifice of blood to uncover the mystery of the moving stones? So that is the plot of the Stones of Blood. Stones of Blood, in my opinion, I think it's a great story and... But if it removes some of the issues that Stones of Blood had, I think it probably would have been a near perfect 10 out of 2, or at least a perfect 10 out of 10. The production was very good. I liked the countryside setting of the story. I felt it worked, it worked given that, giving it a gothic rural feeling to it. The sets were nice. I really like Vivi, well, the, well, the, well, the, well, the carrier ship that Vivian Fay was using. And I liked how little elements of, from past Tom Baker stories were featured, such as a dead ruin from the Arkane Space can be seen, and in Romana's thought, a faceless robot was with her, and that was the same robot that was used to represent Sarah Jane's android double in the, in the android invasion, especially without the face. I love the incidental music in the story, and I think this is the point in the Tom Baker era where we actually hear some great noticeable sto- scores. It was mentioned, well, a shout out to the City of Death, which I'll be getting to soon. <laughs> The script was good, and I think the direction by Daryl Brake was brilliant, and a great first art as well. The plot, I must admit, even though once it was, the plot was very good, and well, though once again we do have elements of the Philip Hinchcliffe era creeping in, but I like how the Stones of Blood didn't do too much to try and emulate the gothic horror elements as other stories in the previous season actually tried to do. Yeah, but this story is very much sci-fi. Even though I do wish the Stones of Blood could have been. I think it, I, I, think, I wish it could have been a little bit scarier as a lot of folklore was mentioned and there were druids at the start of the story and they weren't even mentioned at all after they had all been dealt with to say the least. And of course this is the first time we actually get into more depth of the key to time storyline as the Black Guardian is mentioned for the first time as the white, well, whilst the Doctor was working around the TARDIS controls, of the White Guardian tells the Doctor voice through the voice only, beware of the Black Guardian and and of course, the Black Guardian actually wants the key to time, and which causes the Doctor to later tell Romana that she was actually sent to him by the White Guardian, who was actually taking the form of the President of the High Council on Gallifrey. And this does give some foreshadowing to actually what happens at the end of the season. And then I get onto that when I get to the Armageddon Factor. So the third segment of the key to time was actually the Great Seal of Diplos, which was actually used as a necklace by Vivian Faye slash the Cesar of Diplos who actually stole it and used it for her own dirty deeds. This story does have an abundance of memorable moments. I like the part one cliffhanger where Ramona actually falls off the cliff because the doctor pushed her off the cliff. Even though they never, I think something did push her off the cliff but it definitely wasn't the doctor. I remember watching that scene very well at age nine and I liked how Professor Romford was able to rescue the doctor you know, whilst she was being sacrificed, but well, whilst the doctor was almost getting sacrificed by the druids, granted they ran away afterwards and we never saw them again. But the doctor's trial, well, with the with those sparkly things, does definitely deserve a mention. But I get into more and that a bit later. So yeah, to the acting, which was very good. Tom Baker was very good here. Even though most of his performance in the story was comedy, but it was good comedy, and and I think his comedic side definitely does come out a little bit more during. In his one-handed trial, like at the hands of the Magaro, the sparkly things I was mentioning earlier, <laughs> and I think my favorite part of the story when he puts on his own lawyer wig and actually defend himself, as one of the Magaro that was defending him was clearly not on the doctor's side, even though he, it act he actually what well, he it actually was, but it was pretty obvious that, 
it wasn't on the doctor's side. <laughs> and we also like the bit when obviously the doctor couldn't really do much, so he just sadly he throws his lawyer wig down and prepares to get killed, but then he actually pulls Vivian towards his side to try and like interfere with the execution, but I as it did stun him, and that's how they're able to find out that Vivian Faye was actually the Cicero Diplos. Mary Tam did a good job as Ramona. I did find that funny how Ramona decides to wear heels with an outfit that didn't even match whatsoever. I mean, she wore like a Burberry hat, some sort of jumpsuit, and decided to put heels on underneath. That was just... <laughs> and the doctor did actually tell her that it would, she would, it would all hurt her in some way. And, and the doctor tells her to change, and she even picks up another pair of high heels. And they were even bigger than the ones that she was actually wearing, and... And that was just <laughs> so obviously when Ramona starts realizing when that the was starting to hurt her a bit, she decides to go bare, barefooted. And then, then obviously when the doctor rescues her from the cliff, she decides to change her entire outfit. Yeah, time because she wanted to, because the doctor told her to put on some boots. But when I say she just put on another another pair of high heel well high heeled boots, but <laughs> we can't win them all like that. And yeah, I think Romana's Romana's naivety is starting to creep in a little bit in this story and, and I think Romana is definitely this Romana is definitely starting to mold into the classic damsel in distress companion as obviously part one she falls off the cliff. If in part two she's sent up to the carrier ship thanks to Vivian Fay. But speaking of that, I did like how Romana was actually trying to after the doctor freed her and she was able to return to Earth. I did like how she was trying to find evidence that Vivian Faye wasn't who she, who she says she was and Lita finds out that she was allergic to certain diets like citric, citric acid I think it was yeah I think and her and Kane and Amelia Faye were trying to like find find that out speaking of Kane and I think he was very well used here and judging by the location filming I was surprised that the canine the, the canine pop was actually there I mean granted he, he wasn't he didn't move around a whole lot but but the ground was quite flat, to say the least. But I did like how he was able to get Professor Romford to fix the projecting of a device so the Doctor and Mona were able to return to Earth from the hypers from hyperspace. Mm -hmm. And you also liked how K9 was trying to put up a fight against the Ogre, but it didn't succeed and he actually received heavy damage from them and it pretty much did wear out his battery to say the least. So yeah, I think Kane is definitely at his best in this story and for most of the season as well. On to the side cast. They weren't a whole lot, but they're okay. But we had one character that actually stood that actually stood out compared to the other side characters. So kicking off our group of side characters, we have Professor Amelia Rumford. She was an archaeologist and the author of a book called The Bronze Age of Bur Bronze Age Burrows in Gloucestershire, which the doctor said it was the defi def definitive rock on the subject. She came to Bos to Bos Boscombe Bos to because of her interest in the consistency in the survey of the nine travellers, along with Vivian Faye, and, and I think she was a great character, and she definitely stood out. I liked how she was able to repair the projecting of the device after Vivian had destroyed it. You know, Kanan was able to assist her in doing so, but the fact that she was able to do, to actually fix it without any form of difficulty, as far as we know, was good. And I think she would have made a great companion, but the act actress... Beatrix Lehman actually died shortly after the story aired and obviously her relationship with Vivian Faye, I think they were like companions or with a bit of a home with a bit of a romantic subcontext between the two. I mean I think I think Mary I think someone actually mentioned this to Mary Tamman and I think she laughed it off and said we were also innocent back then. I mean I mean the I mean I didn't really notice it. I mean the way I saw it was just like two female friends just living with each other, even though one of them was actually, even though who Emilia Romford was, was fucking carrying a police beam's truncheon, I don't know what was what they were using that for, but <laughs> but I didn't think I didn't really see any romantic context between the two, and unless they're you doing something with that truncheon, but who knows? <laughs> we have Professor De Vry, De, De Vries or De Vries. He was the leader of the Druids that worship the Kaliak. Like he later he attacked the doctor when he came to visit and tried to sacrifice him, but later on he and fellow cult member Martha were killed by by one of the by an ogre. And of course, final rounding off, we have the Magara. They were justice machines or big sparkles carrying out galactic law. They claimed themselves to be judge, jury, and executioner. They had even 
I think they'll try. I think they even destroyed an entire galaxy by holding, be- because they're held in contempt in court or something like that. And they charged the doctor for breaking the seals, was as they were looking for the sister of Diplos, but stupidly enough, or they didn't have an is an image of her, so they're just pretty much looking for her, without even knowing what she looked like. And so after the doctor was able to knock her out during his field, his botched execution, they were able to identify her. Identify her. They were okay, but I think they were a little bit overpowered. But to be fair, they're only there for, for most of part four anyway. So, yeah. So, on to our villains of the story. We had the Ogri. They were silicon-based life forms that were from the planet... From their home planet. I've forgotten. I think it's Ogrius or something like that. But And they were big, deadly moving rocks and they fed on blood. Blood. And they were okay, but they were meant to have been like rocky humanoids. But for some reason, they decided to go for the large moving rocks. And of course, we have our big bad, the Cicero of Diplos, also known as Vivian V, also known as the Kaliak, the Celtic Goddess, also known as Morgana Montcalm, also known as Signora Camara. She was wanted for multiple counts of murder and the theft of the seal of Diplos, which was the third symptom of a key to time. She had three ogre of her, and the Megara were like, in pursuit of her, but then... She was able to escape because they did not know what she looked like. Hence the reason why she was living on Earth for at least 4,000 years. And hence the different aliases as well. When the Doctor gets the Megara to recognize her, she's turned into one of the in one of the nine travelers as, as her imprisonment and punishment. She was a good villain. She was somewhat intimidating, but not as intimidating as Queen Zangsi on the Power Planet. But she did pose a very credible threat to the Doctor Romani in the story. And I kind of... Like that, to say the least. But the the thoughts of the stones of blood. It doesn't I mean, it doesn't really take away from most of the story, but if they were reduced, I think it would have been probably one of the best. I mean, it is what I think are oh, the best Tom Baker stories, but so to get to first of all, I think the pacing was a bit iffy in some parts. And it did drag a little, and but I think the overall pacing was actually okay. But I think it was, I think the pacing issues are means mostly seen in the beginning, to say the least. And some elements of the story weren't explained at all, such as the giant footprints the Doctor Romana encountered upon arrival. And I think the part when the Ogre killed the two campers was obviously used to fill out some part of part three. And and my final nitpick of the Stones of Blood, I think this is another story that could have been a little bit more serious, as there was a bit too much comedy. And to say, and to be honest, I think that's my main issue with the key to time itself. It was very comedic. I mean, I mean, there's nothing wrong with too much comedy. I think it could have been alleviated a bit to be a bit more serious and just they could have like balanced it out a little bit more. I think, but I think the most the most comedic elements can be seen in the following story, the Android of Tara. But I think this is the problem this season actually has and a major problem in the Graham Williams era as a whole. And a thought and another thought I have is Romana's character, as I did mention. I think. She is starting to, I think she is starting to regress as she's pretty much molding into the damsel in distress companion here. And obviously she falls off the cliff in part one. Part two, she's sent up to hyperspace and, and it does get a lot worse in the following story and the story after that. And I think, and I think this is definitely one of the, why many, most people actually preferred the second Romana to the first Romana and... Yeah, I can definitely see why. I mean, and obviously, considering the fact she's she's supposed to be like the doctor's equal, or at least somewhat smarter than the doctor, but then obviously to make sure she's not, she doesn't like overshadow the doctor. She just decide to like make her damsel in distress. But it does kind of make sense in a way because Romana, as I said it before, is she is quite naive and very inexperienced. So, but I don't. But having her in, but but I wouldn't really like think is a good idea having her. Getting captured the left, right, and center all the time, to say the least. I mean, yeah. And the, although this isn't the fault I actually have with the story, but I do, I would say this is an improvement. I think it could have, I would have made a slight improvement to the story, as obviously the Stones of Blood was the hundredth story ever made in Doctor Who, and it is a very big milestone. And also, Doctor Who was actually turning fifteen shortly after, like a couple of days after Part Four aired, uh, and nothing was actually done to celebrate the occasions on screen and. There was supposed to be, but there was a scene where Romana and the Doctor actually, sorry, Romana and Kanan actually surprised the Doctor with a 751st birthday party, but it would have been nice to see, to be honest, but Graham Williams thought it was 
it was a bit too self-indulgent, but I mean, you can't win them all, I guess. So, to conclude, The Stones of Blood is a very good story. It's a very fun watch, and and it's a very witty story as well. And doesn't actually like. Yes, it does have some elements of like horror, but it doesn't actually like. Doesn't actually try to emulate what the Philip, Philip Hinchcliffe era did, and it pretty much. It did like the horror element in its own way, but making it like making it more of a sci-fi-ish theme of some of the elements some of the fantasy elements there so that was a pretty good choice and without it that one of the best installments of the key to time season and season 16 as a whole so i would give the stones of blood a 9 out of 10 my next review would be the androids of tara the fourth story of the key to time so thank you for watching please let me know what you thought of this review and the stones of blood itself but please let me know what you, you Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already and join my Discord server if you want to do so. Until then, sayonara.